Let's talk about spears, baby. Hey folks, Matt Easton here of Scholar Gladiatoria and um, I have spoken many times in the past about the awesomeness of spears, okay? And um, in fact, Lloyd Lindy Beige and I did a little bit of an experiment recently at Fight Camp uh, looking at spear versus sword. You'll see that on his channel. Um, upcoming video. I don't think it's up yet, but anyway, upcoming soon, hopefully. And um, I have always strongly made the argument that spears, you know, if the sword is the queen of weapons, then the spear is the king. Well, I do think that that's by and large true. And some people have said to me, oh yeah, Matt, but you know, the spear is a formation fighting weapon. It's a weapon that undoubtedly is the king of the battlefield when it comes to fighting in groups, but the sword is the, is the individual's um, weapon par excellence. Well, uh, no, I disagree with that. Um, by and large, I would say that the spear used alone dominates the sword in most circumstances. Now, indeed, if you get someone who really doesn't, isn't very good fencer, isn't a very good fighter, and you get someone who's a really good fighter, and you give the really good person a sword, and you give the really bad person a spear, then yeah, many times the sword person can win. By no means is it like a magic uh, ticket to winning, okay? However, if you get to take two people who are roughly average, um, then uh, in terms of ability and, you know, and that could be athletic ability, but also knowledge, um, uh, in other words, fencing um, knowledge, then indeed the spear will pretty much um, always dominate unless, and there are a few exceptions, and I have covered this in previous videos, but for anyone who hasn't seen those, um, shields change a lot, okay? Shields mess with spears hugely, okay? Because they, they block the, the long straight angles that spears uh, tend to attack from. So shields change things. Um, armor changes things. Uh, if someone's wearing lots of armor, then it gives them the ability to close distance whilst taking hits but not being wounded. Um, obviously, there are degrees of armor. If you're thinking of someone off, a, you know, from the, the ancient world, so they might have some type of cuirass, maybe some greaves and a helmet, they've still got lots of open bits. So their thighs, their arms, or sometimes their faces, their throats. Very often there are openings which you can jam a spear into quite happily um, until you get bored or they get dead. Um, but uh, in the medieval period, again, you get variations of levels of armor. But someone, for example, at the Battle of Hastings, who's wearing uh, quite a lot of male armor with a, with a helmet, Spang and Helm or other type of um, nasal helmet, they do have some exposed bits, so they've generally got some of their legs is, are exposed, maybe their forearms and hands are exposed, uh, and their faces are a little bit exposed. You still have a large nasal, and then you have a koi front here, but nevertheless, they're, they're by and large got some openings. You can get spears into those, but the fact that they're covered in mail reduces their chances of taking wounds as they move in close, and that's what it's all about if you're fighting against the spear and you don't have a spear. It's about closing range closing distance. Um, but if we get into the later medieval period, say the 13th, 14th century, when we start to get a mixture of plate and mail, so plate over mail, essentially, um, at that point, then it becomes very easy to close down a spearman if you're wearing armor. So in short, um, armor really changes the game against spears. But if we're talking about an, a, a lightly armored or uh, unarmored environment, so kind of like a duel in an open space, um, then then once again the spear has the the single spear against a single sword has a huge advantage. One other area where you, of course, where the sword will come into its own and the spear might no longer dominate is in a restricted space. I mean, that's kind of obvious. And in fact, if the space is so restricted, in fact, the sword might not work very well. In some cases, you know, if you're fighting in a, a toilet cubicle, then a knife will probably be a better weapon than a sword. So it's all about context, okay? Captain Context is here to slam some context into you. Um, and uh, quite simply, um, different weapons for different scenarios. But if we're fighting in an open space, we can move around, we're unarmored, there are no shields, there aren't people shooting missiles at us, all this kind of stuff, it's just one person fighting another person. If you have a choice, um, if you have a choice between a sword and a spear, most of the time, take the spear, unless there's some particular thing you know about your opponent that means that the sword might be better. But generally speaking, take the spear. But 
What is the point of this video? I've said all of these things before, although I understand not everybody watching this video will have seen all of my previous videos, so some of that may be new to you. I hope so. Um, and, uh, but what is the main point of this video? Well, the main point of this video is the Spear does have these advantages for um, a few key reasons. One of them is that a Spear is long. Now, ironically, for the purposes of this video and the space that I'm shooting in, I'm not actually holding a long spear. I'm holding a spear that is longer than most swords, but is not uh, really a, uh, a long spear. But for the purposes of this video, imagine it is a long spear. I do have a long spear behind me, but I'm gonna get that out and I'm gonna whip that out for you in a minute. But if you can just hold, hold keep your, stay patient for now and wait for me to get the big weapon out, then um, looking using this purely as a, as a visual aid, okay? So if we've got a spear that uh, is on, it's a pointy blade on the end of a, it can even, doesn't even need to be a blade as such, it can just be a spike on the end of a pole, okay? Now there are some advantages, the key advantages that, 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 um, that relate to how you can overcome a swordsman are to do with um, reach, so length in other words, um, and speed. Okay, now those two things are connected to each other inextricably and it's just to do with geometry. Quite simply, if the end of my weapon is a long, long way away from me, by moving a small bit at the back, it moves a long way at the front. Okay, it's as simple as that. And by being able to um, move a little bit at this point of origin, so near, near my body, by moving a little bit here, if the blade moves a lot, being further away, this also relates to longer swords, things like um, rapiers and such like. Um, by moving a long way here, it means that the person who's trying to defend themselves has to move their hand around a lot. So very simply, if you're using a spear against a swordsman, you want to uh, do false attacks known as feints. I'm sure most of my viewers know that, but do a feint, uh, for example, to one side, dip under and actually stab the other side, or feint high, stab low, or feint low, stab high. And then of course you can split it, as Lichter now would have us do, into uh, four quadrants, okay? So you could um, feint high left, and then actually stab low right, or you could go feint high left, stab low left, or feint high right, stab low left. All of these different options, okay? In addition to that, so you've got a huge amount of reach and you can stab them and be doing feint attacks and real attacks at a distance whereby they cannot hit you, okay? That's the primary advantage. But the secondary advantage with this long pole is you have the ability to vary the length. Okay, now one way to do that is you're holding the weapon here. To stab someone, you don't only have to do that because your hands can move anywhere on the shaft of this weapon. Now that usually means that what you do is you hold the weapon here because that's the easiest way to hold it. But if you want to stab someone really quickly, rather than just moving your hands forward at the same speed that your um, both arms can extend, okay, you can do that at the same time as pushing faster with the backhand and then reset again. So in other words, you can, what's sometimes known as snooker cue, um, or um, slip or slide the weapon like this. Additionally, you could take that to its natural conclusion. You could momentarily, and this is done with bayonets and spears, you could momentarily let go with one hand to get a bit more reach. If I passed with the back foot, I can do that even more and then pull it back and I'm back on guard again. So you've got a huge amount of reach, but in addition, if a person starts to close on you, you're not only limited to this range, just like a sword can do things with the pommel and with the cross guard and things like this and half swording, so can a spear. If a person starts to close on you, you could bring the weapon back here and fight at very close range, or you can actually choke up on the weapon and use it at basically dagger range, okay? So if a person, say for example, I thrust at someone and they knock my point aside, I can bring the weapon straight back to here, thereby denying them the bind, and then send it back out again. So the spear is incredibly versatile, okay? Um, not only can you uh, move the tip around um, to places very, very quickly, but you can hit the person from a distance that they can't hit you back, and you can vary the reach of the spear, anything from in an extreme, as far as you can hold it out one-handed, to as far as you can bring it back up next to your body. Okay, so uh, now, there are some other things a spear can do, okay? In addition to that, when your weapon is in contact with the sword, 
you have a greater amount of leverage. Why would that be? Well, quite simply, the amount of leverage you have on a weapon is very relative to, partly to the mass of the weapon, but very relative to how far apart your hands are. Now, generally speaking, unless you're using a huge two-handed sword, your hands on a sword are either going to be one hand on the sword, or even if it's a two-handed sword, about that far apart at maximum. With a spear, on the other hand, they might be that close, they might be one hand, or it could be anywhere up to there. Now, you might say, ah, oh, half sorting, yes. Indeed, a sword can half sword, and that would be the way that you would overcome a superior bind if you wanted to, to charge in, close in. This is shown in treatises, both with rapiers and with long swords. Shown in Morozzo, for example, also shown in uh, Gigante um, with a rapier. Um, but yes, this is the standard, rather than have to switch, this is the standard modus operandi for a spear. So indeed, your hands are normally quite far apart. They can slip closer to get extra reach, but they can slip apart very, very quickly and easily. More easily than you can with a sword. So that's another advantage with it. Um, now there are other advantages, I'm not going to list all of them. Those are the main ones. There's one that we don't often talk about in hand-to-hand -hand combat, and that's the ability that you could throw it. Now bear in mind that a spear is usually a primary weapon, well in fact pretty much always a primary weapon unless you've got a missile weapon. Okay, so if this is your primary weapon, potentially you could afford to deliberately lose your primary weapon if it's going to gain you a tactical advantage. And I fought in a tournament where this was allowed, where the spear throwing was allowed. And I tell you, it instantly changes the way you fight. If you've got a sword and shield, and the opponent has a spear and shield, you're kind of evenly matched, okay? Remember, shields are involved, and that changes the nature of the game. So if they're spear and shield and you're sword and shield, I would say that you're kind of evenly matched. You've each got slightly different strengths and weaknesses, but you're quite similar. But the spearman is able to throw the spear. Now, if you allow the spearman to throw the spear, so as you would in combat, as we see on Greek vases, and as we know they did in the Viking era, um, if you're able to instantaneously throw the spear and draw out your sword, well, that is a huge potential advantage because the entire time that you're fighting with sword and shield, you're having to watch out for that spearman potentially lobbing their spear at you and then charging at you with their, with their sword and spear. Um, and bear in mind, they could throw that anywhere. They could aim to, to, they could aim to butt, your, butt your shield and throw their spear over the top of your shield, or they might just decide to throw it down at your legs and leave you with a spear sticking out of one of your thighs whilst they then charge in at you, pulling their sword out. So spears, spears are boss. But there's one final message I want you to consider with spears. Think of all the things I've just talked about, the, the reach, the ability to hold it one-handed and slip, uh, the speed, the mobility, the ability to throw. Now, there is one thing you can do to a spear to really mess up a good percentage of those advantages, and that is to make it heavy. Okay. Now, a lot of people, when they're coming at it from a sort of computer game or role-playing game perspective, think, oh, well, if a spear is awesome, why don't we make a spear even more awesome by adding blades on it or making it bigger or turning it into a hewing spear or a partisan or a glaive? And the fact is, there are some advantages to these larger, heavier versions of the spear. But you have to recognise that whenever you increase one thing, you very often decrease something else. And the point is that when you add things onto the spearhead or make the spear bigger or heavier, you're decreasing its ability to be able to use it one-handed. Oh, it's now very cumbersome. Um, it's slower to just to thrust. It's slower to move around. It's uh, heavier at the head, which means if someone bashes it with their weapon, it's slower to get it back online again and present a threat. If someone knocks, uh, someone binds your, sword, your spear and charges in at you, so you want to be able to slip the weapon and fight at point blank range, it's now a bigger, heavier, more cumbersome thing to move around. And you can throw it, but you can't throw it very far and you can't throw it very quickly. Okay, so it's difficult, for example, to do a faint throw and then a real throw. Um, additionally, if the head is bigger, you have to hold it proportionately closer to the head as well. So um, you, if you're holding it ready to throw at the point of balance, then um, you've not got very much reach with your weapon left. So really, just to conclude on that point, the spear 
for all the reasons I've spoken about in this video and in previous videos, is an absolutely formidable and awesome weapon. But if you make it too heavy or too long, for example like a pike, then you give up a lot of the advantages that the spear has. Now, one final question, and this came up at fight camp, in fact in conversation with, with Lloyd, with Lindy Beige, um, I believe, and I think that he might agree with this, that there is an optimum length for the spear that you would choose to use um, two-handed, so not with a shield obviously, um, but there is an optimum length for the spear that you would use against swordsmen. The danger as a spearman against a swordsman is that the swordsman is going to close you down and try and take off your lead hand, try and close down your shaft um, and basically get up close and personal to you and take you apart with the sword. If you have a weapon that is very long, like a pike as an extreme example, so say a, a 16 foot long pike, okay, so imagine I'm using a pike. If they knock that point aside and charge at you, what are you supposed to do? Well, basically, you've got to drop the pike and pull out your sword, okay, or run. Um, you can't use the pike in versatile ways in the way that you can use a short spear. However, if your spear is really short, um, this isn't particularly short, but as you can see, it's pretty short, so it's about, what, five foot long, then equally, you don't have all the reach advantages that you have a slight reach advantage, actually, even with a five foot spear, but you don't have all the reach advantages that you do with a sword, certainly a long sword or a rapier with the shorter spear. Um, so clearly somewhere between something that's like an Asagai or Iklua, um, or this is a dervish, in fact, a Sudanese spear, something that's between that length and a pike is clearly the optimum length. So where is it? So if we say between five feet and 16 feet, well, opinions will vary, but my personal view is actually the optimum length for a spear for fighting on foot against swordsmen in close combat is probably about six foot or seven foot long. Okay, so relatively short by spear standards. Bear in mind that the standard spear length for infantry formations is more like eight to eight or nine to 10 foot in length, okay? I'm sorry, I don't know the meters, you'll have to do that conversion yourself. It's about two, it's more than two, about two and a half meters, I think. Um, so I would say eight to 10 foot length is probably historically normal for formations, but that's probably slightly too long for fighting single combat against a swordsman. For single combat against a swordsman, I would advise about six or seven foot long, which incidentally is about the same length perhaps even a little bit shorter, as most quarter staves. Um, and I think there's probably a relationship there. There is an optimum length to what is advantageous against a swordsman. So it's not simply longer is better, it's that there is longer is better up to a point, and above that it becomes a hindrance. And also weight as well. Remember that the bigger you make it, the longer you make it, the heavier it gets, the more unwieldy. Um, so there we go, folks. I hope that's been somewhat interesting. Don't always think that bigger is better. Don't always think that making a blade longer is a good idea. In fact, this is a fairly cumbersome weapon that I wouldn't particularly necessarily choose in single combat. And, and this is about the biggest, so a winged spear of the Viking era, or a partisan, that's about the biggest uh, size head that I would personally choose for single combat. And indeed, I would want the blade to be made as light as possible. This is the Hanway um, winged spear, incidentally. The blade on this is a little bit heavy for my taste, so I'd rather have something that was lightened down. Um, and most partisans are relatively um, light. Um, so there we go, folks. That's been more or less interesting. Yes, the spear is king, but don't add too much to it. Don't make it too long. Don't make it too heavy. Um, and if you adhere to those rules, then you'll be able to wipe the floor with lots of swordsmen especially if you practice with it as well. That always helps. Cheers, folks. Thanks for watching. We've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers, folks.